Let's read together Psalm 33. The whole of Psalm 33. (coughs) Rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous, for praise is comely for the upright. Praise the Lord with harp. Sing unto him with the psaltery and an instrument of ten strings. Sing unto him a new song. Play skillfully with a loud noise. For the word of the Lord is right, and all his works are done in truth. He loveth righteousness and judgment. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathereth the waters of the sea together as an heap. He layeth up the depth in storehouses. That all the earth fear the Lord, that all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. The Lord bringeth the counsel of the heathen to naught. He maketh the devices of the people of none effect. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. The Lord looketh from heaven, he beholdeth all the sons of men. From the place of his habitation, he looketh upon all the inhabitants of the earth, he fashioneth their hearts alike, he considereth all their works. There is no king saved by the multitude of an host, A mighty man is not delivered by much strength. A horse is a vain thing for safety. Neither shall he deliver any by his great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy, to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waiteth for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart shall rejoice in him, because we have trusted in his holy name. Let thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us, according as we hope in thee. Amen. Lord's Day 9 of the Heidelberg Catechism. Lord's Day 9 begins a new section entitled, Of God the Father. What believest thou when thou sayest, I believe in God the Father, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, that the eternal Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who of nothing made heaven and earth with all is in them, who likewise upholds and governs the same by his eternal counsel and providence, is, for the sake of Christ his Son, my God and my Father, on whom I rely so entirely that I have no doubt but that he will provide me with all things necessary for soul and body. And further, that he will make whatever evils he sends upon me in this valley of tears turn out to my advantage. For he is able to do it, being almighty God, and willing, being a faithful father. Beloved, with Lord's Day 9, we come to the first line of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And just think for a minute of all the millions of saints who have confessed their words, their faith in these words over many centuries. Baptismal candidates. That's probably the origin of our Apostles' Creed. A summary which baptismal candidates would learn, would confess, and be baptized. Lisping children. It's not too much to memorize 
the 12 short lines of the Apostles' Creed, even for those who are young, and even reformers like Martin Luther, who used to say repeatedly that even though he had contended for decades with the devil and the Pope, that he still got no further than the Apostles' Creed, and he used its words every day. And within the continental Reformed tradition, Many others have confessed Lord's Day 9's explanation of the first line of the Apostles' Creed, such as students in catechism classes for over 450 years, and whole congregations, young and old, all around the world and its continents. And we're doing the exact same thing tonight, joining with the church in confessing the truth of God our Father and his good creation. Let's look at that tonight under the theme, living faith in God our Father. Living faith in God our Father, noting three simple things about God our Father, that he is first, the creator, second, the provider, and third, the turner. More on that in due time. The creator, the father, and the turner. That expresses our living faith in God our Father. You could say, beloved, that there are two words that sum up Lord's Day 9's teaching on creation. The first word is everything. Look carefully with me at answer 26. It says there that the eternal Father of our Lord Jesus Christ made heaven and earth with all that is in them. And when it says heaven and earth, heaven and earth, it means first of all this planet, earth, and heaven covers the sky above it, outer space, and even the third heavens where Jesus Christ dwells in his glorified human nature with the angels, and the spirits of just men made perfect. God made all this, the Catechism rightly says, heaven and earth, with all that is in them. And so I say again, the one word that sums up Lord's Day 9's teaching about the creation is everything. God created everything. We could even use the language of John 1 verse 3, which refers to God's work in Jesus Christ, the Logos. All things were made by him. There is the positive and then the negative. And without him was not anything made that was made. Everything. That's the first key word. The second key word, which sums up Lord's Day 9's teaching on creation, is nothing. That's what it says, and in this instance, in so many words. The eternal Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who of nothing made heaven and earth with all that is in them. God of nothing made heaven and earth. We need to guard against a possible misunderstanding here. We must not misunderstand nothing as if it were really something out of which everything was made. When it says nothing, it's not as if that nothing was a substance out of which God made everything. What it means is that before the creation, only the triune God existed and there was nothing besides him. And this creation of everything, of nothing, as you may know the 
Latin phrase ex nihilo, out of nothing, excludes the very popular and very hard to understand Big Bang Theory. The notion that the universe originated in a gigantic explosion. Because this posits pre-existent or eternal matter. Although once you read the theory, they try to guard against this and you need to be both a, a physicist or an astrophysicist and a philosopher to understand what they're talking about. According to that theory, there was something and that everything came from something, the singularity as it's called. But the Reformed faith, in the words of the Heidelberg Catechism, says that God made everything of nothing. And all who hold to the Heidelberg Catechism must believe and confess that nothing existed before the creation, that there was nothing except God, and that he then created everything so that no forms of theistic evolutionism or any compromises with the Big Bang Theory and evolutionism can be tolerated in a Christian or Reformed church because then the church doesn't even believe the very first line of the very shortest and earliest Christian creed. And then the church is finished. It's all over. The only question is how long will it take the church to die? Because it has already been holed beneath the water line and the ship is taking in water. It's going to sink. And I say that because about nothing and everything here, because that's, those are the words of the Heidelberg Catechism. There are a whole host, host of other arguments we could use in Genesis 1 and other places, but we're confining ourselves here to Lord's Day 9. And then there's Psalm 33, which we read earlier, and which puts some more flesh on the bones of Lord's Day 9. Verses 6 and 7 of that psalm elaborate on the ninth Lord's Day. Verse 6 says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. So here we have the heavens and all their host or armies, including birds and clouds and planets and stars or to use the language of the catechism God made heaven with all that is in them then verse 7 moves to the earth including its oceans and seas and their very depths he gathereth the waters of the sea together as a heap he layeth up the depth in storehouses. This same psalm, beloved, too, teaches what is familiarly known, at least in books, as fiat creation. <coughs> fiat from the Latin meaning creation by command, divine command. Verse 9. He spake, and it was done. If only parents had that level of obedience. He commanded, and it stood fast. The divine speech in the form of a command, so that it was done, and it stood fast. And the fitting, and the only proper response to this, that God just commands, and things spring into existence immediately is the fear of God. That's what this psalm teaches. The fear of God in everybody 
because of his creation by spoken word. Verse 8, let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For, this is the reason, he spake and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. And of course, every teaching in the world and every teaching in the church which substitutes for the truth of creation and God's creation by divine command necessarily, and at the very least in most instances, is intended to lessen the fear of God in people's minds. And the idea that God spoke and the world was brought into existence, that makes people fear God. He did that. He only has to utter his voice. And out of nothing comes everything. God's fiat creation that is his creation by command is further explained in verse 6 by the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth the word of the Lord here is the personal word that is the logos he who is mentioned in John chapter 1, the eternal Son, who is the Word and the wisdom of God. By the Word of the Lord, that one, that personal Word, the heavens were made, and all the host of them were made by the breath of His mouth. The breath of God's mouth, or the breath of the Word's mouth, both take us to the same conclusion because breath is spirit. The Holy Spirit or the Holy Breath, the third person of the Holy Trinity. And so even Psalm 33, just as Genesis 1 and John 1 and other places, even Psalm 33 teaches that creation like all of God's works, is a Trinitarian work. The triune God makes and forms all things. He does this by his word, the Son, the wisdom of God, and he does this through his Holy Spirit. <coughs> Staying with Psalm 33 for a while longer, verse 4 states, the word of the Lord is right, and all his works are done in truth. God's word is what he says, and God's works are what he does. Then verse 5 adds, He loveth righteousness and judgment. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. And if you ask, why? Why is the earth full of the goodness of the Lord? Well, it's because God created it. The earth must be full of God's goodness, his covenant goodness, because God made it, and it's in a covenant relationship with him in Jesus Christ. The earth's full of God's covenant goodness because Jehovah made it by the Son and through the Holy Spirit. And this explains the opening words of this psalm which are an extended imperative to be glad in the Lord and to praise Him. Verse 1 says, Rejoice! In the Lord, O ye righteous, that is, be glad in him. Think about who he is. 
and may he be your joy and contentment. Rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous, for praise is comely for the righteous. And then we're exhorted to praise God and sing to him. And then verse 4 says, Why? For the word of the Lord is right. All his works are done in truth. He loves righteousness and judgment. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. Why? Because of his Trinitarian creation of the Father by the word and through the divine breath God has created all things by his <coughs> command. This same psalm in verse 11 even teaches that God decreed the creation. He eternally purposed that he would make the world. Verse 11, the counsel of the Lord standeth forever. The thoughts of his heart to all generations. This is what stands behind God's creation as its eternal plan. God's eternal counsel and decree then not only includes his creating of all things, this is what he had intended, but verse 12 even refers to the election of the church. Verse 12 states, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. In the first instance, this refers to Israel. As the Old Testament people of God, they are the nation whose God is the Lord. They were the only nation who were such. They were the people whom he chose for his own inheritance. And the nation here isn't Great Britain and Northern Ireland. It isn't France or China or any other nation in the New Testament age. The nation here is the holy nation of the people of God. Because it says, blessed, that is, in Jesus Christ and by his Holy Spirit, blessed is the nation, the holy nation, whose God is the Lord, and the people whom he has chosen for his own inheritance. And chosen means elected, elected in Jesus Christ. There is no special chosen nation identifiable on a map, either now or at any time since the ascension and outpouring of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. We are the blessed nation, the saints from every nation, tribe, and tongue. And then, coming back to Lord's Day 9, beloved, we believe and confess that this eternal Father who of nothing made heaven and earth with all that is in them is for the sake of Christ his Son, my God and my Father. This is what the Christian church has always claimed. The same God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit who makes the world, who speaks and is dumb, who forms everything whereas there was nothing but God prior to the creation who works all things according to his eternal counsel, is now, says the Christian, my father. <coughs> and this to us could even be said to be a sort of commonplace. And in fact, that's what the devil does in the church. He makes wonderful truths through the sinfulness and slothfulness of our own hearts, which are to astound us into common places that we all know and take for granted. And the preaching of the word is designed to shine up these wonderful things that are to be our comfort and take them out of the boring, dull, I already knew that, and I'd be taking that for granted and presuming upon that for so long, and into the right column of worship. That this infinitely exalted God is my Father. This is the case because of the mediation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because the Lord Jesus, the incarnate Son, has God for his Father. 
And all those who are in Christ by the Holy Spirit and through a true and living faith have God for their Father too. Because since God is the Father of the Lord Jesus, if we're in Christ, then he must be our Father too. He's the Father of Christ in a higher sense to be sure, but it's impossible to be in Christ and not have God as your Father. This comes to us, as you know, by the grace of adoption, whereby the Almighty God legally takes us, who of ourselves are fallen sons of Satan and the image of our father the devil, into his family. And this adoption, just as freely as justification, is by grace alone, in Christ alone, and through faith alone. We are adopted through our believing upon the basis of the death of Christ for us. And this is Ephesians 1 verse 5. God predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. That is, it was a sovereign will of God in our society. There's a lot of paperwork to be filled in. And it'll probably cost you a lot of money and take a lot of time. And there are other people's wills involved, sometimes the child, sometimes the biological parents and the state. But God, according to the good pleasure of his will, and through satisfying of his justice through the death of Jesus Christ, adopts certain people as his children, freely, willingly, entirely his choice, and not determined by the choice even of the sinner. And here too we need to understand the ministry of the Holy Spirit because without him no weak sinful human being could ever be certain that the God who made all things by the word of his power in the space of six days and all very good that that God is our Father. And so the internal witness of the Holy Spirit through the Word of God is necessary for any human being to be sure of this. Otherwise, all you would have at best is a probability, is a conjecture, is a I think so, or I would like to believe it is the case. Here's Romans 8, 15 and 16. We have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, <coughs> But we have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Similarly, in Galatians 4, we read that Christ came to redeem those that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons, and because we are sons, God hath set forth the spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Without that, you never could know that the God who made the world is our Father for Jesus' sake. And that's why all of the pagan religions at this point boil down to a sort of mysticism. You stare in yourself and you try and convince yourself and you look for an experience. Whereas the Christian religion teaches believe, believe, and teaches the ministry of the Holy Spirit through the Word to work assurance of the truth of Scripture to you personally. And the payment that was made to the justice of God to bring us back into his family was that of the Lord Jesus' atonement on the cross. Full satisfaction to the offended justice of God whereby our substitute bore the punishment due to us for all of our sins. And so now the creator of all things and our father 
For Jesus' sake then promises, as fathers typically do, an inheritance. And the inheritance being the new heavens and the new earth. God says to all of his children, I've made this world, it's under the curse to be sure, but you have a place in it for a time. Live there as pilgrims and I'm going to give you back the whole world in Jesus Christ. Hope for it and be patient as a new heavens and a new earth in which dwells righteousness. I have an inheritance for you. I'm a gracious father. Believe my goodness and persevere. Like our earthly fathers too, our heavenly father provides for us. The catechism says that he provides for us all things necessary for our bodies. And even the children here could write a fairly lengthy list of all the good things that their heavenly father provides for them as regards their bodies. He gives us homes and clothes and food and drink and health and strength and heat and light and even our every breath. These are good gifts from God, moment by moment. And when we're older, God provides us with the means by which we obtain the money with which we purchase things we need for our earthly existence. He gives us jobs. He gives us our education to equip us for our work. He gives us friends who sometimes can help us get a job or advise us as regards our employment. And when we say, well, there's jobs and you've got to go to school and learn things and friends can help you, we're not taking the, taking away from God, we're saying that God gives these things because he is sovereign over all, including the means by which we obtain the good things necessary for the body because they are all embraced in his temporal <coughs> providence, which is also according to his eternal <coughs> decree. And I have no doubt, says the Christian, that God will provide me with all things necessary for my soul as well. And what do I need for my soul and for all my spiritual life? Well, I need communion with God in Jesus Christ through prayer. God provides that. We have a mediator. We have the Holy Spirit who quickens us. God provides for me as to my soul the comfort of the gospel of grace. I need that. I need that as much as I need my breakfast. I need that more than my breakfast. That's true. God gives me the forgiveness of sins and everlasting righteousness. I need that. God gives me grace each day to preserve and keep me. He quickens me spiritually. He gives me the communion of saints with light minded believers. I need that. And when we say that God provides us with all things necessary for the soul, we also are including the church because the church is the one great divine institution that God gives us to take care of our souls, especially. The family does that too, but the church is the great institution God has provided to care for us as to our souls. The church doesn't do that much for your body, for instance. It's not the point. But it does take care of us as to our souls. And when we say the church takes care for our souls, we don't mean a false church which doesn't preach the gospel properly and corrupts the sacraments and doesn't bother with church discipline or only hurls thunderbolts against people who are rebuking it for its sins. We mean a true church. God gives that to take care of us for our souls so that we join and remain in such an institution 
or we move to such a congregation or labor to establish such wherever we might be. And God gives us the sacraments in the church too for our souls. Baptism and the Lord's Supper for me, for my family, including our children. God gives us the lively preaching of the word, which quickens our lively faith. God gives us catechism for our covenant seed. That's caring for the soul. God gives office bearers to oversee and provide guidance and instruction. And when we talk about the good things that the Lord provides us for our soul, we also include here reading material. Because outside of the public worship or assembly of the saints, the number one way in which God provides for us as to our souls is reading. He gives me a Bible in my own language so that I don't have to go to university or buy six books or attend special online classes to know Hebrew or Greek. I can just pick it up off the shelf. And there it is. Zechariah in English and Paul's epistles and the books of Moses. They're all there. And he gives me reformed books and periodicals so that without rendering myself completely broke, I can obtain for myself in the 21st century a number of key books that I can read and receive spiritual benefit for my soul. And this is the work, if we will only see it, that is, if we will only think about it, that is, if we only believe, this is the work of Father caring for my soul out of mercy. He provides for me these things. So that I feel, even in the pew, I feel grateful. I take it that there's a little bit of gratitude stirring in your heart, even if it hasn't been the most spiritual Sunday for you. You're saying, I do feel grateful. I do like these things. I do value them. Good. Keep it up. Moving on then, we come to our third point. The third and final one of the points tonight, you will have noticed, is the most cryptic. And my wife raised her eyebrows at this one too. We're looking tonight at living faith in God our Father. The Creator, that's fairly simple. And we've covered that. The Provider, you knew what that meant too. By and large, when you saw it on the bulletin, or heard it announced near the start of this sermon. And then thirdly, the turner. And the turner is simply a reference to a part of Lord's Day 9. And it's the third part too, as this answer 26 is divided up. Which states, further, further to the fact that God is the creator and God is the provider... And further, I believe that he will make whatever evils he sends upon me in this valley of tears turn out to my advantage. And this means that God is the turner. In his wisdom, he turns all these things that we would think either are for our destruction or designed simply to drive us up the wall or things that are indifferent and really can't benefit us in any way, that God turns them to our advantage. And that's a great work of the divine wisdom. You've got to believe that because none of us here with our limited understanding can see how God turns these things or at least how God turns most of the things. We sometimes see it and sometimes we see it about six months later or a week later. But God does it whether we understand it or not. We believe it. And this is another massive claim that God turns all these things to my advantage. In fact, the Catechism says, I have no doubt but that he will turn all these things to my advantage. And the Catechism then grounds this claim regarding God, the turner of all things to my advantage, 
grounds it upon his power, since he's almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and upon his will, since he is a faithful father, a faithful father who can turn the world, who can turn the hearts of kings, is the one who turns all things for our advantage. And that's good news too. Let me give you an example. Do you believe that God can and that God does work all things for good in the following instance? Let's say all of your siblings, or all of them but one, hate you because of your godliness. Not because you're annoying, but because you're godly. Can God turn that for good? Let's say God has you in his providence sold into slavery. Can God turn that for your advantage? Let's say you are falsely accused of a crime that you did not commit. Can God bring that good out of that? Let's say you are then imprisoned wrongly for that crime that you did not commit. Let's say you end up rotting in prison much longer than you ought to have done because of the bad memory of a supposed friend who promised you that he'd do what he could to get you out of jail. Can all these things work together for good? Well, that's the life of Joseph. That's the life of Joseph. And I suppose, especially as I work through it, that dawned upon you. And that's the point of the life of Joseph. It's a picture, not of Christ and his sufferings, but it's a picture of a saint tried with horrendous trials. Now, there are certain things about Joseph that remind us of Christ, not because he's a picture of Christ, but because God conforms the life of the believer in various ways to the life of Christ. He died on the cross, and believers take up their cross and follow him. What about, since we're talking about all these things that God the Turner can turn to our advantage, what about if you face delays or even cancellations? Let's say, for the sake of illustration, with your flights or with your operations. Can God turn that for good? Can God turn for good awful diseases which bring debilitating weakness and, as we would see it, an early death like cancer or MS? And can God turn to our advantage all the things that do make us weep or which would make us weep if there weren't other people in our presence? Because Lord's Day 9 especially has these things in mind. I have no doubt, says the Christian, and he's, he's in strong faith this day, he's, he's doing well, he's not backslidden when he's making this confession. I have no doubt that God will make whatever evils he sends upon me in this valley of tears turn out to my advantage. It's not I have no doubt that when I have a great day, and everyone smiles at me and I get just what I really needed that day in the post. And it comes and, and all the rest of it. And the sun's shining. But it's I have no doubt that God will make the evils, the evils in the valley of tears, turn out to my advantage. Especially that because even an unbeliever can say, though without reference to God, that I have no doubt But when everything goes my way, everything's working out for good for me. But it's the believer who believes in the sovereignty of God and who understands that God, the Father, Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, is my Father for Jesus' sake, who can make this confession. And the hardest thing about this confession resides in the little word, me. I have no doubt that he will make whatever evils he sends upon me in this valley of tears turn out to my advantage. Because all of us, including me, 
in the pulpit tonight can philosophize at great lengths and maybe even wax eloquent at certain points about the goodness of God's providence in the abstract. And for other people, no matter how bad it may be, because I'm personally at this moment not affected by it. And then we say, well, poor so-and-so in all his afflictions, and poor so-and-so in all her troubles. That's a good job. We heard a sermon on Sunday night. And the minister said that God will work it all out for good. And could you pass me the milk, dear? And then the me bit comes in. Because many of us tonight, or at least some of us, will think, well, I'm not having it too bad. And I can easily see this. But for other people now, or for ourselves or other people in the future, the evils will become more forceful and the valley of tears much more difficult. And then when things become hard for us, then we'll think, you know, I really should have paid more attention to that sermon. I sort of tuned out Lord's Days 9 and 10 because there isn't really that much deep theology in them. Yeah, yeah, everything works together for good. The minister always says that and the Bible says that. But what did I care? I was just a teenager. I didn't really listen. I thought I knew all that stuff. And then when it hits us, we need to remember and we need to recall the promises of God. And when Lord's Day 9 talks about the evils that he sends upon us, this certainly includes chastisement. And chastisement, especially from the hand of God, is painful. There is no such thing as painless chastisement. It's like dry water. Painful chastisement, that's the point. And chastisement comes from God's hand. And God can smack very hard. And even the secular left-wing state can't ban him from doing it. But the word of God teaches us that God's painful chastisement of us proves his fatherly care. Here's the admonition in Hebrews 12. Ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. And then Proverbs is quoted. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. He scourges us. And whatever that is, it's bound to be, be sore. If ye endure chast chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? And this is what the unbelieving secularists are doing. They make it impossible to chastise our children. And this is going to mess up children. Because if their earthly father can't chastise them, why would their heavenly father do that? Because fathers are to reflect God. And then you're going to end up with a new generation of wimps and crybabies who can't handle anything. And then they're going to think that the God who didn't just chastise his own son on the cross, but who actually punished him for our sakes and out of love, could never really be the father at all. That's what the devil's up to in all this. And then it says, after what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons? That's going to confuse children even more. No chastisement. Does daddy really love me or does he just allow me to go on in my sins? Maybe he wants to destroy me. A few verses later we read, with regard to our earthly parents, sometimes they chastised us after their own pleasure as seemed best to them. Sometimes they didn't do it very well and that was their sin too. But God does it for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, 
it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them that are exercised thereby. And all this, beloved, God the Creator, who provides for his people and who turns, especially this last bit, turns all things for good, is seen especially in the earthly life of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the model in this regard too. There were some impending evils that God averted, even in our Lord's early days. Herod the Great was going to kill the baby Jesus as soon as the wise men came back and told him where the baby was laid. So God then told the wise men to go home some other way and he told Joseph to take the family into Egypt. And God averted other evils during Christ's public ministry. After his first sermon in his hometown of Capernaum, with some in the congregation not being too enamored by his preaching, they wanted to push him off a cliff to his death. That would have made for a short public ministry and an inauspicious end to his sermonizing. But God cowed the crowd so that Jesus was able to pass by without them laying a finger on him. And this happened on at least two other occasions recorded in John 8 and 10 when the Jews were going to stone Jesus. God averted those evils. He wouldn't have Christ die yet or he wouldn't have him die in those ways. And then Judas was going to betray Jesus. Sometimes God slowed up the execution of his son, but other times he hastened him. Judas was going too slowly, so Jesus said, What thou doest, do quickly. So the traitor went out that night, brought the guards to Jesus, so that he would then die at the Passover as the Passover lamb. And when we come to the cross itself, we see that God there certainly made all the evils that he sent upon his son in this valley of tears turn out to his advantage. And this was the problem with the two on the Emmaus road. We had hoped, we had hoped that this same Jesus, the one that killed, we hoped that he'd been the redeemer. But he couldn't be. And yet, and yet the women said that, that the tomb's empty and some of the disciples have said we can't make head nor tail of it. And God worked it for good. He worked it for good for Jesus Christ so that through his sufferings God exalted him higher than the heavens. And he worked it for the good of all of his elect. So that we, the beneficiaries of the salvation he obtained for us, would also look at how God turned everything in his life for good and for our good. And believe that he'll do the same thing for us since he's a faithful father and the Almighty Creator. Amen. Let us pray. <coughs> our Father in heaven, comfort our hearts by thy word that we may be encouraged and that we may learn not to become bitter or to worry or be anxious, but especially in our hardships and when we feel this life to be nothing but a valley of tears, may believe in thy goodness and see thy fatherly hand. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.